Isn't it awesome to know that God still changes lives? You're supposed to respond to that. Isn't that awesome? I mean, today we had baptism service. We had 30, I think, between the two services uh, that ranged from single-digit age to people in their 80s. So people as children that are dedicating their lives to following Jesus, and he's radically changing their lives to people that are discovering him late in life. And he still changes life. Isn't that something to celebrate? Come on, let's celebrate. That's, a, that's good news. The first service, I had the privilege of baptizing my son, Titus. And uh, so I just want to take a quick poll to see how well you know me. How many of you think that I cried? <laughs> Man, I bawled like a baby. So Titus is my second son, second oldest son, and a real tender-hearted dude. And, uh, and before service, like as service was starting, or first of all, this morning, I'm still sleeping. And I hear like someone awake in my house and going down the stairs and lights are getting turned on. Now, I'm thinking maybe it's Mary because she gets up earlier than I do. And I look down and I can realize, no, that's not Mary because I can hear her getting ready in the bathroom. And I look down, like, wow, what's going on? My son Titus got up. He was up and ready like at 6.30 a.m. this morning. He was ready to go. So before service started, I was sitting over here and he was over here. Then I looked and he was already kind of getting emotional. So I'm like, don't look at him. Don't look at him. Don't look at him. <laughs> so there was two people baptized. He was the third. I was making my way over. And he starts walking and he's bawling. He, as he steps into the baptismal, well, he looks at me and goes, I love you, Dad. <laughs> I, I love you too, baby boy. Come here. <laughs> oh, man, it's touching. So that was a powerful moment. And uh, this is nothing like that. So if you're a guest, let me introduce myself. My name is Matthew Johnson, uh, lead pastor here at the tree. I'm so glad you're here. We know on services where we have baptism, typically we have a lot of friends and family that are here. So we hope you feel very welcomed here today. And if you would, stop by guest reception. It just allows us to begin that process of connection, welcoming you, giving you a gift, and uh, we just really appreciate that. All right, so everyone, we're in a series. We're in the third week in a series, and the series is called A Kingdom Without a King, and what we're exploring is that a reality that now for us as in our nation, as Americans, that this is really becoming a global phenomenon, is that we are becoming a post-Christian culture, a culture that's moving on from their belief system that God is real, that the values that God has taught us in the scriptures matter to our lives. And as we look at it, post-Christian isn't just simply saying we're moving on. It's really that the culture sets itself up in opposition against God. And so we're exploring what that means. What does that mean for us as individuals? What does that mean for us as a nation? What does that mean for us as Christians? And instead of just taking an outward look and condemning culture and looking at people in culture saying they're wrong, they're evil, they're the reason that this is happening, we recognize a very sobering truth, and it's this. That it's not the responsibility of people who are not in a relationship with God to reflect God to the world. There, there has never been any expectation, any accountability in the mind of God for that. Instead, it is the responsibility of the people who claim to be in a relationship with God to represent God to the world. And so we began this series with a, series with a really tough question. What if the reason that the world is removing God from culture is Christians did it first? Jesus taught these radical teachings about radical love and radical generosity, radical patience, and, and to live a life that is so different than anything that anyone had ever experienced, and he called us to live this way, and yet for many Christians, we quit doing that. We, we quit following the example that Jesus has set and also quit following the teachings that he's commanded us to use as an authority in our lives. And so as we quit following God and we quit living this radical life, the world took notice. And they started to recognize that we don't even believe the things we claim to believe. And so the world said, if Christians aren't going to keep God a part of their lives, then why should we? And so we've been evaluating what this means for us. What does this mean for us as people? Because when we look at the scriptures, God makes it very clear that he wants us to have a great life. And, and, and I use that term, it's kind of a relative term, kind of subjective to the situation. But when, when Jesus came to the earth, he said I came that you might have life to the fullest, or life abundantly. Jesus wants us to have a full life, and, and part of that is there are things that God wants to provide for us that will allow us to have a full life, and these are the things we're looking at in this series, and the things are direction, and value, and freedom, and purpose, and so God says, I want to provide these things for you, but the problem is, for us as a culture, is when you remove God from the equation, you're removing God's provision of these things. And so when we remove God, what happens is we then become responsible to find these things in our lives. And so last week, we started to look at these kind of one by one, and we began in direction, even though in my mind that should have been the second one, and I'll explain in a moment. 
but we began with direction. And what we're looking at is, how do we know the choices that we're supposed to make in our lives? Well, as Christians, God has made it clear. He's given us his word, what we would call the Bible, and specifically the New Testament scriptures, the teachings of Jesus, that he's laid out what we're supposed to do in our lives and how we're supposed to live. But the problem is for us as Christians, we quit using the words of Jesus as the authority in our lives, and instead it simply became an influence. We would pick and choose what we're going to apply to our life if we find value in it. But the problem with that is the moment you quit submitting 100%, then you become 100% in charge. So we became God of our own lives. And so when we remove God from the equation, what our culture tells us is this is the rhythm of life. That culture will direct us and tell us how to live. And if we follow the pattern of culture and follow culture's direction, then we will find value. And once we find value in how our culture defines value, then we're going to truly discover freedom. Freedom from all the the things that, that hold us back from experiencing life at its best. And then lastly, that will help us lead us to the purpose of our lives. But here's the problem. The economy of God is actually different. The economy of God begins with value. And so I'll say a statement to kind of explain it. In the economy of God, value leads to direction, and direction leads to freedom, and freedom leads to purpose. In the economy of God, we begin by first understanding the value that God has placed on our lives and how that value is found in a relationship with him. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on value. We're we're going to look at what it means to our lives. And so I wanted to say a statement just to get us all on the same page, and then we're going to kind of go deeper and deeper in this principle. So here's a statement that I think we all can agree on. We all need to both be and feel valued. We both all need to be and feel valued. And those aren't always one and the same. Sometimes those are different things. I'll give you an example. For me in my life, the person that I value the most the person that's most important to me is my wife, Mary. So obviously I'm a father of four and I don't, I don't rank my love, but just in the dynamic of marriage, I know one day my kids are gonna find spouses, they're gonna move out and, and then Mary and I would be by ourselves. And so Mary is the person I value the most and I would say that that is true for her. She values me the most. But just because we are valued doesn't mean we always feel valued in that relationship. And and I can kind of look at almost every argument that we've ever had, every fight that we've been in, every season where where we've been frustrated with each other, and it all goes back to one of us not feeling valued in that relationship. Sometimes when someone doesn't put your needs as a priority in their life, you don't feel important, you don't feel valued, and so you're frustrated. And, And so what we understand is being valued and feeling valued are not always connected, but when they are becomes this very powerful thing in in our lives. When you know that you're valued and you feel valued, it becomes a foundational principle in your life that you can build upon. Because I want you to think about it. When you truly feel valued, when when someone, specifically like say in a relationship, when they have made it known through their words and through their actions that they absolutely value you, you have security in that relationship. And it impacts your worldview. It impacts how you you face life on a day-to-day basis. When you have a job that highly values you, you have security in that job. When, when Even in a financial sense, when you have finances, you have literal value in your life, it adds a layer of security. And when you feel this way, when you feel love, you can start to feel peace and you start to feel security and you start to feel true joy in your life. It's a, it's a critically important thing for all of us. And so when we think about value, I want you to start thinking about your own personal life today. Because I think a lot of us struggle at times in our lives with really feeling valuable. There are are so many things in our lives that tell us the opposite, that we're not valuable. And there are people that I'm positive will be here today that have had people in their lives and the culture as a whole that has told them over and over that you're not as valuable as this person or you're not valuable at all. And so we struggle with that insecurity. And, And the reason that all of us potentially have this insecurity is simply the reality of the culture in which we live. See, we do not live in a culture that adds or affirms value. It's just simply not the culture that we live in. I will go even further and say it this way. We live in a culture that intentionally devalues. Our culture that we live in, and I'm going to explain why I I feel this way, and I think you're going to follow my logic, but we live in a culture right now that intentionally devalues us. 
And so we today have to ask the question, how do we find value? Is it possible to find a type of value that is apart from the behaviors of my life of what I do right or do wrong? Is it possible to find a value that cannot be shaken, that I can really build my life upon? So in order to do this, though, we have to first look at our culture. And so I'm going to spend the first half of today's teaching just focused on our culture. The last couple of weeks, we've been inwardly focused. I'm going to focus outward for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to come back and look at what the Scriptures has to say, which is a completely different message. But as I transition, let me ask a question. Hopefully, you can be bold enough to be honest. How many of you love conspiracy theories? You're going to love the next portion of this message, okay? I don't think it is a conspiracy theory, but it's going to feel that way. So here's, here's the truth about our culture, that we are now a culture that consumes information. We are a content-driven culture. I remember a couple of years ago, I was just reading about this phenomenon of, of our generation, and I read this statistic that was just like, it was hard for me to get my mind around. It said that the average person in our culture, like right now, consumes more information than previous generations did. I'm sorry, let me say it this way. An average person in our culture consumes more information in one day than previous generations did in their entire lives. And I want you to think about that for a second. So we have, for our reality is the internet and smartphones and TV and movie and newspapers and printing and all that. But there were generations, not even that long ago, 100 years ago, where people would go days, weeks, months, even years, and never discover more information, never hear news. If you were in the middle of the prairie, like I picture in my mind, like Little House on the Prairie, like that type of situation, th there's a chance that you wouldn't get new information for weeks. It, something could happen on one of the coasts in our country, and by the time it got to you, it would be weeks, months, even years later. And so the average person wasn't consuming information over and over. But in our generation, I mean, most of us wake up in the morning and the first thing we do is we grab a, a smartphone, a device, and we start to read the news and we start to check social media and we start to just take in information. Well, the reason we have to acknowledge that is this, the information that we're taking in is very much impacting the decisions of our lives. If we're watching TV and we're watching celebrities and we're watching the news and we're reading articles and we're going on websites... This starts to shape so many things in our lives. The information we process shapes our view of morality. It shapes our view of ethics. It shapes our view of politics. It shapes how we think we should conduct ourselves in relationships and in marriages and, and how we should parent. And, and every generation is influenced by their culture and the information they take in. And so we're taking in tons and tons of information. But if you ever pause to ask yourself the question, who is creating this content that I'm taking in? Because here's an, a, a, a statistic that maybe you've never heard, and I think it's one that's shocking. Of all the media that we take in, okay, all of the media, this is movies, TV, radio, internet, print, everything, 90% of the media is controlled by six companies. And this actually might be a smaller number. This is as of 2018, and there's been some major mergers in the media world in the last year because of like uh, Netflix and, and Fox and Disney have, have combined with some different things. But six companies control 90% of the information that you hear. Uh, I read this week that 80% of radio stations have the exact same playlist. The, these companies are determining what you process in your life. These companies are determining your views of politics, your views of morality, your views of ethics, how you're going to conduct yourself, how you're going to decorate your house, what cars you're going to drive, what type of clothes you're going to wear. It determines all of that. And so when we look at this, the question that we have to ask is, what is their motivation? What, what is the purpose? As they're trying to get us to take in the, the content that they're creating, what is their purpose? Well, here... Boldly and clearly understood, they would tell you this, their number one purpose is to make money. That's not a conspiracy. That's not a pastor just getting up here and ranting against the media. This is what they would tell you. These companies, if you, were, if you have a stock in their company, you have shares, and you had a meeting, or they send out their newsletter, they would tell you their purpose is to make money for their shareholders. So the groups 
that are our number one influencers in our lives, their motivation is to make money. Have you ever paused to think about how that's impacting your life? So the next question would be, well, how do they make money? Well, there's two elements to it. The first one is they have to create content that's going to bring you back in. Because if, they, if you don't come back and click on their website, buy the ticket to the movie, turn on the radio station, buy the book or magazine or newspaper, if you don't, if you don't come back, then they can never make money. So they want to create content to draw you back in. So how do they do that? Well, they stir your emotions. They romanticize life, which is a polite way of saying they create a false reality. And, and I'm not even saying necessarily they're doing this with evil motives, but this is their strategy. They want you to embrace a reality that's not yours. It allows you to disconnect from your own reality and go into a fantasy world to find enjoyment. It's the reason why actors and actresses, they don't look like us. Sorry to be the one to tell you this. I don't mean this as an insult, but they're better looking than us. They're, they're the ones that are the best looking, the best in shape, and, and they drive cars that we don't drive, and they live in houses that we don't live in. I mean, our houses don't look like theirs. And every single one of them, they're smart, and they're funny. And you know why they're smart and funny? Because every single word they say is scripted. Even, even things that we would call reality TV are not reality TV. It, it's scripted. And, and so they create this false world that all of us long to just be like. Have you ever seen a, a marriage, like a romantic movie, and this dating process and the marriage process? It's wonderful. But here's the problem. Problem. None of our stories look like that. And so it's, it just starts to plant a seed in our heart that my marriage isn't good because the romance isn't like it is in that movie. And, and my life isn't good because I don't have the job like that person has in the movie. And, and the standard that we see over and over is this romanticized world that creates some discontent in us because we're not actually living that. And so we go to the movies and we watch TV shows to disconnect from reality. But at the same moment, it's creating our sense of reality. Then on top of that, these organizations also control the news. And I'm about to say something I'm going to trigger all of you, okay? All news is fake news. I know some of you are like, oh, no, you didn't, Matthew. I don't mean that in any sense like a political statement. I don't say that because I know one political party says that more often than the other. But here, I'm not saying it as a political thing. I'm saying all news, as they communicate it, it is no longer for the purpose of informing us. It is for the purpose of getting us to come back to the source so that they can continue to make money. Their motivation is not informing, it is to make money. And so what does the news do? It over-dramatizes. It makes everything more dramatic, more intense, more divisive. And so, I mean, even the phrase, if it bleeds, it leads, it came from the concept of the news. Because more people will watch if it's more dramatic. And so we buy into this, this idea that our whole country is divided and we all hate each other even though that might not be the reality. Every single day, I'm in relationship with people who b believe different than I do politically, and we're fine. We're not yelling at each other, we're not screaming at each other, but if you watch the news, you would think that's the reality. And so one thing they want to do is they over-romanticize, over-dramatize, stir your emotions to get you to come back. But then the second element of how they make money is they then sell time on their media to companies who can advertise their products. And so companies will hire an advertisement agency, and this agency will hire or buy time on one of the forms of media, and then they try to sell the products of the company. But how do they do that? They do it by creating insecurity in us. The message that every single advertisement has at its root is that you are not good enough, your life needs something more to be satisfied, and specifically, you need this product. And they say on average, we see between 3,000 to 5,000 advertisements a day. So 3,000 to 5,000 times a day, you are being told this message. You are not good enough. You need something more in order to be satisfied. And I want you just to think about it. Just think about the, the ads that you see. I mean, even this past week, just you're watching the, the TV and like there's an ad for shampoo. And, and how do they do it? They get this woman who has this beautiful flowing hair, and, and she keeps doing this, right? Like, even though if, if someone did it in my life, I'd be like, stop doing that. Like, that's distracting. Like, stop it. 
But see, they keep doing this, and then they show you the picture of your hair. And it looks like a person who's been stranded in the desert for like a decade, right? <laughs> Their hair is fried, split ends, and it's all dried out, and they're like, that's you. That's every single one of you. But if you just use this product, your hair will be like this. Even though that woman probably had, you know, four or five people working hours to make her hair look exactly like that. And, and honestly, I feel, I feel bad for women because I think you're, you're targeted way more than even men are. But, I mean, think about it. Like, let's just kind of go down the body. Then they'll tell women, like, you have crow's feet. Like, whoever decided that that's a bad thing? Like, like I'm being serious. Some advertisement company said wrinkles are bad. Now, think about this. Wrinkles are inevitable, Right? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with them, but we have been sold an image of beauty. And so they say, you're bad because you have crow's feet, so you need to put this lotion on. And then you need to buy this makeup to cover your imperfections. And then let's just agree, all of us are fat according to their standards, so we all need a product to, to make us thinner. And if we're not going to get thinner through exercise, and you've got to buy these pants or this tight shirt or Spanx or Spanx, whatever you call them, and you've got to buy these things. Am I right? It's just constantly being told, like, you're, you're just not good enough. And then here's the unfortunate thing that just happened in my life. I just turned 40. I have no idea how they know this. But they're telling me, you need to check your testosterone. I'm like, that is none of your business. <laughs> we are not talking about my levels of testosterone. My, my best friend growing up on my birthday sent me, happy birthday, you need to check your testosterone. I'm like, I'm not having this conversation with you. I'm, tell, I'm not having this conversation with any of you. So when, I'm, when you're leaving today and I'm standing by the door, do not bring it up, okay? <laughs> but we just hear this message over and over again, don't we? You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You need this product. And maybe it's something small to buy. Maybe it's something big to buy. But even now, in, this, in the last couple of decades, it's even transitioning to where now companies aren't even trying to sell you a product. They're trying to sell you an experience. Because if they can sell you an experience, it's actually cheaper for them because they don't have to make a product. But in all the advertisements, it's all now based on how you feel. Don't buy this car because it gets good gas, gas mileage and it's safe. That's how they used to talk about it. Now it's, if you buy this, just think about the experience you can have with people. Just think about the experience you can have with your family. You can go to this restaurant and live in this area of town and you can go on this vacation and it's the experience and how it makes you feel. So all of a sudden now, the standard of success is different. Success is determined by the products you consume and also the experiences you have. Now, I want you to think about that. The groups that you are now a part of are based oftentimes on the products you consume. Oh, we wear clothes from the same store. We drive the same type of car. We go on the same type of vacations. Our houses look the same. We decorate the same. And, and we start to find value and worth in the products that we take in. And then also it's about how we feel, so the experiences we have. Oh, you've gone on vacation there. I have too. You should go there. I go to this restaurant. I loved it. You should go to this restaurant. And what happens is the very definition of success of life has changed. There's a book that actually influenced this entire series. So if you're a reader, I strongly encourage you to read this book. It's fascinating. It's called The Trouble with Paris by Mark Sayers. Mark Sayers is a Christian, and it's a phenomenal book. But here's what he said. He said, no longer do we look for big dreams to shape our lives. Instead, we prefer to chase the experience. Anything that curtail this chase, be it a commitment, a mortgage, marriage, or family, must be dropped in the relentless pursuit of new and stimulating experiences. We must feel good to feel as if we have li lives of significance. It's about how we feel. It's about the products. But here's the problem, is that it's not real. It's actually a term called hyper-realism beyond what is real. Culture keeps painting a picture of what the ideal life looks like, but it's not real. Nobody can attain it. And the reason they do this is they don't want you to actually have a life that you can attain. They want it to always be just outside of your reach so that they can keep selling you more and more products. And so there's always this mindset, if you just have this car, if you just have this house, if you just have this type of marriage, if you just date like this, and if you just look this way, and if you just have these clothes, and if you just have this job, if you just have this, then you'll be happy. But the problem is, it's never attainable. Mark Sayers, later on in the book, says this. The reality is that as soon as we purchase an experience, it is gone, and we need another hit in order to be satisfied. We find ourselves on a treadmill seeking out new experiences that leave us adrift and disconnected. 
constantly dissatisfied, yet continuing to center our lives around the unrelenting sampling of packaged experiences, a sampling that leaves us wanting to be saved in the future by the romance of when, yet eternally stuck in the present. The romance of when, the romance of when I have this, when I do this, when I can accomplish this, that's when I'm going to be happy. But it's never actually attainable, so we're stuck in the present. We're stuck frustrated. All right. It gets worse. Because now we've added on top of this social media. And every single one of us has bought into this rhythm, so we're also now a part of the problem. And every single one of us that uses social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, any other form, is that we are also adding to the illusion of life. All of us, the things that we post, we post to continue the branding that we want of our lives, how we want people to view us, and those are the pictures that we post. And again, I don't, I don't think we have ill intent, but it's just the rhythm of the culture that we've been trained in. It's like a person, you never see a person walk around their house and go, like, open the laundry room and go, man, look at all that un, you know, undone laundry. Take a picture of that. <laughs> Share that on Instagram. See how many likes I get with that. Oh, look, all the dishes are not out. Selfie, right? <laughs> We don't do that. Instead, we post the pictures of our families, and we post pictures of the restaurants we go to. And again, I'm not saying it's wrong. Did you hear my heart, though? Every single one of us keeps painting the image of what life is. So we, we look at these other people's examples, and we look at these other people's lives, and we just think, that's what life is. That's what life should look like, and we know ours doesn't look like that. And so the message that's being communicated to us and by us is that normal is a failure. Success is an illusion, but normal is a failure. If you have a normal marriage, that's a failure. If you have a normal family, that's a failure. If you have a normal job, that's a failure. You need to be exceptional. And so we hear this message over and over and over again. From the youngest of age until who we are now. And what happens is no one is valued. Everyone is branded. Every single one of us is being branded by our culture. Every single one of us has a label that's being stuck on us. And some of you are here today and you're frustrated by the label that's being stuck on you. You feel as a failure as a parent, failure as a spouse, failure in your job. You just feel frustrated by life because you don't really feel valuable. And it's because you have been raised in a culture intentionally designed to devalue you. But friends, what if there is a different message that's actually true? What if the rhythm of our culture to remove God from our culture is actually the worst thing we could ever do because when we remove God, we remove the value of our lives? What if what God says about you, what Jesus said about you is true and that you all, each one of us, has a value that cannot be shaken? So here's what I want to do in my remaining time is I want to, I want to say a different message. I want to speak this to you and I hope it sinks into your minds and your hearts. Because this is the message that Jesus came to proclaim. Jesus came to the earth to say something to you because he wanted you to be so confident in this that nothing could shake it. So here's the first truth is that Jesus determined your value. The culture has never been able to determine your value because they're not the ones who created you. Jesus determined your value because you are created by God in the image of God. I, I want you to think about that because culture wants to keep reworking you and changing you to become more like everyone else in culture. But God's word to us was, no, I created you specifically with you in mind. Let me read a couple of passages that I hope will touch your heart. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. As God was creating everything in the account in Genesis, in these different moments of time, after each one, he created the earth, and he created the animals, and he created all these different things. After each one, he said, it's good. But on the day that he created humanity and he was finished, he looked at it and said, it is very good because humanity was different. Humanity was created to reflect the qualities of God to the world, qualities of relationship and love. And God wanted to be in a relationship with humanity. I know there's a lot of animal lovers in here, but God has never claimed he wanted to be in a relationship with animals. He wanted to be in a relationship with humanity. And so there's nothing in our culture that can ever shape that or change that. But it wasn't just that God was passively involved in your creation. 
Scripture tells us that he was specifically involved in your creation. In Psalm 139, it says this, for you formed my inward parts, speaking to God. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. This beautiful image that God was uniquely designing every single one of us. He was creating our personalities. He's creating our hair color and our body types. And he was creating our personalities and our sense of humor and, and all of our talents and abilities. But he wasn't just creating you and then throwing you into the world. He was creating you for specific days that he had planned for you. Which means that God has an absolute purpose for your life. And so culture keeps telling us your worth is based on what you look like. If you, if you look skinny enough, or if you're strong enough, or if you're smart enough, or if you're talented enough, and God goes, no, 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 I created you specifically, and I'm happy with you. I designed you this way. And, and is there value to eating healthy? Sure, but it doesn't change your value. You can be healthy or you can be unhealthy. Your value never changes because God says, I have a specific plan for your life. And God has placed you in a, in a place where he is allowing you to influence and be connected to others that he wants you to love them and connect to them and to be used by God to, to communicate to them that God loves them. So every single one of us, it, it doesn't matter what job you have. It doesn't matter your successes or failures. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter your talents. God has placed value on your life because he created you that way. But here's what all of us have done. All of us have sinned. We've all disobeyed God. And whenever we make mistakes in any area of our lives, we feel devalued. But Jesus wants us to know that the value he's placed on us went even further. Jesus purchased you with his life. Because when each one of us sinned, we sold ourselves into the slavery of sin, a situation we could never change on our own. And so Jesus says, I will purchase you back. And how he did it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, for you were bought with a price. And that price was the very life of Jesus. God became man and went to the cross and died on the cross for our sins to show us the value he's placed on our lives. And over the past year, probably a year or so ago, I was reading this article. And at the time, I, I wish I could have uh, found the specifics of it, but at the time, this painting was sold. And it, was, it went for the most money a painting has ever gone for. If my memory serves me right, it was like $140 million, give or take. But it was around $140 million. And I remember when I saw the painting, my thought was, that's ugly. Honestly, I just looked at it and I thought, you could give me that painting and I wouldn't put it up in my house. Like, so I know that says a little bit about me and my culture. Uh, I'll give you another example. Mary and I went to New York recently and uh, we went to the Met, this you know, world-renowned art place. And, and when we were looking and going to it, I got online and people were like, man, you need to spend five days there. What you should do is get a week pass and you should spend four or five hours a day there just taking it in. And Mary and I were like, or <laughs> we could do the whole place in two hours. Like that's how, so like we would walk into these rooms that would have paintings on every single wall and this is how we would do it. We were walking there like, oh yeah, look at those paintings. Those are cool. All right. And we would walk into the next room until I got to one room and I was like, oh look, George Washington, that's cool. Took a picture of it. You know, move on to the next room. But anyway, going back to my initial thing. So I'm looking at this painting and it goes for $140 million and I'm thinking, it doesn't matter how much money I would have I would never pay $140 million for that. But do you know how much that painting was worth? $140 million. Because someone was willing to pay $140 million for it. Do you know how much you're worth? See, if you were to ask the person next to you, they might give you an answer. If you were to ask culture, they might give you a different answer. If you might talk to someone who you've let down in your life, they might give you a different answer. But here's the answer that is true. This is how much you're worth. Jesus was willing to die for you. He was willing to give up his life and shed his blood to purchase you back. And he said, that's how much you're worth. And there's nothing that can change this. There's nothing in culture that can change the fact we were created by God in his image and redeemed by God by his blood. But do you know what's awesome about Jesus? He doesn't just determine your value. He keeps adding value to your life. 
over and over. Everything he does is just to increase the quality of your life. So one of the things that Jesus does is he redeems and forgives our sins. We keep thinking sins is what hinders us and devalues us, and Jesus just goes, no, I'll just keep forgiving you. It says in 1 John, it says, if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You make a mistake, you feel less valuable. Oh, there I go again. I just keep doing this over and over. I'm nothing. I'm worthless. And Jesus goes, no, 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 stop. Bring that to me. Confess it. And we do that. And he forgives us. And do you know when Jesus forgives us of our sins, it's never going to be held against us again? We're not going to one day stand before God and he's going to say, yeah, I've been waiting your entire life for this moment so I can remind you of all the failures of your life. You're going to go before God and say, God, I did a lot of bad things. And he'll go, I don't know what you're talking about. They're forgiven. I've forgiven them. They're gone. The work of Jesus on the cross was enough to cover it all. It's gone. You're forgiven. But then Jesus doesn't just forgive us of our sins. He also continues to set us free. Because we follow into patterns and we get addicted. We can get addicted to substances. We can get addicted to the rhythms of culture and to the need of praise. And we can get addicted to money. And we can get addicted to all kinds of things. But, but God just continually sets us free. And just keeps showing us a new way to live. You don't have to follow that pattern. Here's a new pattern. And he gives us a path of life. And you know why he does it? It says in Galatians chapter 5, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Why did he set us free? For freedom. He really wanted us to be free. And we're going to talk about that next week. But he says, Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The heart of our God is, I don't want you to be in bondage. I want you to experience life at its fullest. And then it doesn't stop there. He then makes us his temple, the temple of the Spirit of God. Years ago, I was teaching, and I was doing kind of an object lesson, and I was just kind of tricking the crowd, and I said, here, I'm going to show you a couple pictures of different places, and I want you to pick which one you want. And you can have, if you could have this building and everything in it. So the first building I showed was just kind of this plain-looking brick-looking building. Um, it just it was kind of real industrial-looking. And I said, there's option one. And I said, here's option two. And I showed, at that time, it was a house that went for more money than any house had ever gone for. Just, I think it was in Colorado. It was this beautiful uh, log cabin ranch with pool. I mean, it's just gorgeous, all the land and stuff. I said, so you can have either one of these and everything that's inside of it. How many of you want the industrial-looking book and, or a building? And some people kind of raised their hands. I said, how many of you want this other one? The whole room raises their hand. I said, well, you'll get a nice house, but you chose poorly. The first building is Fort Knox. And inside Fort Knox is about $200 billion of gold. And what I was trying to illustrate is it wasn't what it looked like on the outside, it was what was on the inside. And the reason that that's important is when we follow Jesus and we surrender our lives to him, he says to us, we become the temple of the Spirit of God. God actually makes his presence inside of our lives. And it's not just this like passive thing that he's now here and he's in the temple and that's why we're of value. It's that he says, I want to do this so that we can continue to be in a relationship. So the spirit of God interacts with us. He's told us, if we're hurting and we're struggling, I'm going to comfort you. If you start to make bad choices in your life, I'm going to convict you. I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you if that's not the best way to go. And there are going to be times, he says, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of the things that Jesus taught. So you can be reminded of his love, and you can be reminded that his pathways are good. And he says, I'm even going to teach you new things. So as you go through life, God's going to interact with you and show you new truths, new ways of living. And again, this is all God just saying, I, I want to give value to your life. Jesus also gives purpose. Our, our culture is constantly telling us the purpose of life is to accumulate more stuff. The purpose of life is to have fun. It's all about experiences. And Jesus goes, no, I have true and lasting purpose. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose that if you will trust him and submit to him, he'll show you what that purpose is. And I'll tell you, there's nothing else you can do in this world that will satisfy like the purpose God has designed you for. But friends, it doesn't just stop there. Because all of our lives represent something, but at the end of our lives, we're going to physically die. But one more area that Jesus adds value is that Jesus resurrects our bodies for eternal life. 
that he has promised for those who submit to him, who put their faith in him, that they will live forever. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, and this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. You know, one day we're going to move on beyond this physical life, a physical life that is broken by sin. So in this world, there's death. In this world, there's pain. In this world, we are let down and we let people down. And so we mourn and there's sadness and there's brokenness. But eternal life will not be that way. Sin will be removed. Death will be removed. There'll be no more pain, sadness, no more mourning. It will be real, perfect, lasting life for eternity. And again, this is just the value that God adds. So here's our insecurity that becomes the foundation as we talk about this. But I'm going to mess up. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to do something that's going to violate this, and then maybe God will be mad, or maybe I won't make the right choice. And we keep going back that it's based on something we do right or wrong. So I want to read three more verses to you that I think are incredible uh, encouragement to us. The first one is Romans chapter 5, verse 6. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Rome, and he was talking about this truth that we're saved by faith and faith alone in Jesus. And then in the middle of this challenge that he wrote to them, he says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And the word weak literally means powerless. So Paul was talking about that and at this time in our lives where we did not have the power to change our situation, Jesus looked down and said, now's the right time. This group that is absolutely helpless, yes, I love them and I want to help them. So he goes, at the moment we were powerless, Christ said, yes, the right time. A couple of verses later in verse 8, he goes even further. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it's not like Jesus looked down and said, man, they're really getting their act together. They're really trying. Now's the right time. He looked down and said, this group is powerless, and man, they are still making horrible decisions. Do you know what they need? They need a savior. They need to be saved. He said, this is the right time. Paul goes on a couple of verses later in verse 10, and he says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, just pause there, he goes, we weren't just like passive against God. We were actually living in opposition. See, there are some that are here today that this is your testimony. This is where you are right now. Maybe you don't believe in God. Maybe you even ridicule God. You push back. You are an enemy of God. And I think many of us have lived seasons that way where we live in direct opposition to what God wants to accomplish in our world. But I want you to know this. Even in that condition, Jesus looked down and said, I want to save them. There is value in their life. And so in that condition, Jesus came down and he died on the cross for our sins, offering us life. And Paul goes on to say, so even when we were at our worst, if he was willing to reconcile us, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Paul's argument is, if we were at our worst and he died for us, now that we have been saved, all of our sins have been forgiven, we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, how much more will we experience true life? This is the heart of God. When we put our value and find our value in Him, we discover the true security that we need in our lives. And I want to end by reading one last verse to you. As you see, I just wanted tons of scripture to be, to be spoken over you today. If you've ever, this is probably the most popular verse, if you've ever looked or watched a football game and they ever zoom in on the end zone when they're kicking a field goal or extra point, there's always a reference there. What is that reference? Anyone know? John 3.16, right? What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever will believe in him will not perish but will have everlasting life or eternal life. I'm not sure what, what version I have. But here, here's the promise of God. The promise of God is he loves you. And he loved you in spite of you, and he'll love you in spite of you, but he has designed you with value, he has designed you for purpose, and there's literally nothing you can do to change that. And so our culture keeps telling us a different message over and over, but there's one last truth I want to leave with you, and it's this. Your value is not based on anything you do right or wrong. It is solely based on what you allow Jesus to do for you. See, there are some of you that are here today, and you have just heard so many times in your life that you're a failure. You hear it in media day after day, hour after hour, you might hear it in your marriage. You might hear it in your family. Your parents might have spoken that over you your entire life. And you need to hear a different message today, the one that truly matters. 
Your value is determined by Jesus and nothing can change that. And if you allow Jesus into your life to meet you there, to change your life and to touch you, everything will change. Because when that becomes the foundation of your life, you can truly build upon it.